I am a part of the Public Health Student Association, PHSA, and we serve to represent the School of Public Health and all the students in it, from undergrad, grad, doctoral students, all that good stuff. Um, and today we are working with the undergraduate um, student government, and so I'll pass it over to him um, and he'll introduce all that. So Jordan, take it away. Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending our joint meeting today. Um, my name is Jordan. I am the um, public health student um, senator for the School of Public Health for USGA. Um, for those of you who don't know what USGA is, USGA is the Undergraduate Student Government Association here at UAB. Um, we serve to um, essentially serve all of our constituents, which are the people who are in our respective schools. So for everybody in public health, I am one of the two senators here um, for us. So I listen to concerns. I meet with our deans. We um, provide initiatives and interventions to be able to help facilitate growth in the School of Public Health and to connect all the students together while creating a welcoming environment for everybody on campus. Um, so that's essentially what my job is as a Senator for the School of Public Health. Um, and I am looking forward to a, a wonderful discussion with panel this morning. All right, so we'll lead right into uh, letting the panelists introduce themselves and we've saved about 10 minutes or so for this. So guys, you can take as long as or as little as you like, but just like all of you, you know what I mean? So we can get right to the big discussion. I'll go ahead. And start. Do you, oh, David, you can go ahead and start. Okay. Uh, my name is David McMahon. I am the Environmental Health Sciences Senator. I am a doctoral student uh, in the Environmental Health Sciences program with a concentration in industrial hygiene. Um, I'm from born and raised in Orlando, Florida. I moved here about eight months ago to pursue my PhD. Um, yeah, and that's that's me. I'm here as a panelist to, to help facilitate in this discussion. And I think that this is uh, you know most important being that this is um, National Public Health Week and um, definitely I'm excited to advance health equity as we advocate for a healthier nation during National Public Health Week. And that's me. I'll go ahead and go next. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Claudia Dana Martinez. I am the vice president for the PHSA and I am a soon to be graduating senior with a bachelor's of public health. I'm in the accelerated, um, accelerated bachelor's to master's program for HCOP, trying to get my MPH. I currently also am a senior lead investigator for contact tracing here at UAB for COVID. And today I will be talking on behalf of the Hispanic community and I, that's kind of what I'm working on right now. So that's what I will be talking about later. Um, I can go next. Hey guys, I'm Lacey. I'm the Health Behavior Center here in the Public Health, um, school, in the um, School of Public Health, sorry. Um, I'm working on my MPH in Health Behavior. I'll be starting my PhD this upcoming fall in psychology. Um, yeah, that's it. Well, I was, I'm, I was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Go Tigers. So um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Um, I can go next. So my name is Sarah Jelano. I am currently a junior um, majoring in public health. I am the one of the undergraduate senators for PHSA and I am also in the ABM program pursuing my MPH in environmental and occupational health. Um, I'm from Mobile, Alabama. I've lived in Alabama all my life and I really look forward to what we talk about today and you know hopefully hearing everyone else's contributions as well. I guess I'll go next. Um, my name is Jonathan Baker. I am one of the senators for the School of Public Health um, in USGA. Um, it's great to be here with you all today. And I'm a sophomore majoring in public health. I believe we're also joined um, by two members of our community partners. Maybe one, I'm not particularly sure, um, the Magic City Acceptance Center. So I believe they will introduce themselves. Yeah, thanks. Hi, my name is Lauren Jacobs. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am Youth Programs Coordinator at the Magic City Acceptance Center, which is a project of Birmingham AIDS Outreach. So we're a center for LGBTQ youth, children, and adults that has been around for about seven years in Birmingham. I myself am from Birmingham, um, and I'm thankful that y'all uh, included us in this conversation. As, as it relates to the LGBTQ community, there is a lot to discuss. All right, I believe that's all the panelists. If there's any others, can you like speak up now? <laughs> 
Okay, we're good. So we'll get right into the questions. Um, as a rough format of how today's going to go, we've allotted about 40 minutes or so um, dedicated to getting our panelists to respond to about nine or so questions um, with three to five minutes for discussion between the panelists for each question. And at the end, we're going to open it up and ask a couple to the audience if you guys would like to stick around for that. So I will get right into it with the first question. Pretty basic. Um, how would you define equity and how would you define health equity? Are these two different or the same in your opinion? If you'd like me to repeat that, I absolutely can. And if you would like me to call on somebody to start the answer, I can do that too. Or if somebody wants to speak up. I don't mind, I don't mind speaking first. Okay. Um, for me, health equity, you know. So I always like to start with health equity first. I combine the two. It's just something that I always, I've always done. But um, just health, health um, equity, in my opinion, you know, just a person getting the um, proper health care treatment, no matter of the race, uh, race or um, gender and, you know, things like that. Like no one should have a better treatment or the next person because of things like that. I don't know if someone <laughs> add on. <laughs> yeah, I was going to actually add on to that. I think that's a great response. Um, to add on to that, I kind of see health equity and equity is the same thing as well. I think with the way the United States is with our healthcare systems, extremely complex. And for me, it would be universal healthcare would be the best way to achieve to achieve health equity. We've seen examples in Germany and Canada. I think one of the only like flaws of the Canadian system is those really long wait times. But unfortunately in America, we have a problem where people would choose to pay their rent over seeing the doctor because of financial issues. So health equity to me would be people being able to go to the doctor and not having to worry how, about how they're gonna pay for that bill. And because I know a lot of people go to the doctor and then a few months later, they've got a $500 bill and they're unsure how they're going to pay that just because of how complex our healthcare systems is, especially with insurance and insurance is a whole industry that is a for-profit industry. So universal healthcare may, doesn't make that a for-profit industry anymore. So like I said, that's a really complicated situation. I'll, I'll kind of go next. And, um, you know, health equity meet to me, well, health equity is a term that that we also use in health disparities or we also use the word health disparities or health inequities they kind of all mean the same thing in essence so there are a lot of terms that we use for it um so basically it's in my it describes to me uh, the differences in health that are unfair and unjust uh of course there are some differences in health that are naturally occurring in the world that are expected to occur right but it is those differences that are unacceptable because they are unfair and unjust and are predominantly um, determined by your zip code, right? And so, um, you know, I am, I, I forgot to leave this out in my, um, I left this out on accident in my um, introduction. I'm a certified urban planner uh, through the American Institute. I was a, the chief city planner for the city of Wildwood and dealt with this actually firsthand. That was my job, was um, looking at how we could potentially um, address these issues within the community. Would it be through re a regulatory policy, uh, making ordinances? or adding a element to our comprehensive plan, which we ended up doing, which a healthy community element, which is kind of a guide. Um, so to me, it encompasses a lot of different things. Uh, one thing in particular that, that kind of is, is close to my heart is food deserts. I dealt with that in Orlando, uh, in our Paramore district in downtown Orlando. Uh, I worked on that project for over a year um, where we were looking at how we could put better transportation systems in place to take the people who were in this neighborhood um, to get fresh food. Maybe they might have the local convenience store down the street, right? But that local convenience store does not have fresh produce. It has, you know, uh, prepackaged foods, things that you, you don't get your nutrients from. So there is, therein lies a, a tremendous amount of issues. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop here because there's so much more I could talk about. So I'll let the next person, we'll move on. <laughs> um, I guess I would say Something that really helps me um, understand what equity is because equity and equality are often thought of as the same thing when in reality they aren't. And they can be kind of lofty ideals um, that some people don't typically understand. So I know a lot of people who have taken undergraduate public health classes have probably seen the images with 
people and then the boxes that they stand on. So equality would be everyone receives one box to stand on to look over a fence to watch a like baseball game. But that isn't really fair because someone may be shorter, someone who is taller and can see over that fence already already has another advantage. So equity is about distributing those resources in a way that's fair for everyone. So someone may need an extra boost in life. Um, it could be based solely on their gender or their race, or it could be that they are born into poverty. Um, and that in turn ties into health equ equity that if you are born in those circumstances, um, that prohibits you from receiving equal health care, equal medical treatment, um, because you aren't able to provide for yourself and provide for those resources. So it's definitely something that I believe goes hand in hand and addressing equity also addresses health equity. Sarah, that's exactly where I was about to go. That graphic immediately comes to mind, the baseball game with the boxes and the fence. And as you said, there are people of different heights. So if everyone receives the same box, that's the idea around equality, which still isn't necessarily fair. And then equity being everybody gets exactly what they need as an individual. And the push that I love that has happened, at least in that graphic and, and where it's been talked about in social justice is just removing the fence entirely. So what it looks like to have equity um, or to push equity into justice, to push equity into liberation in which the barrier itself is gone. Um, and so in the LGBTQ community, obviously those barriers look like stigma. They look like lack of access to um, financial stability. It looks like lack of access around education as it relates to LGBTQ individuals. And so the more that we can remove those fences in the health equity space, I think the more that we actually get to an actually just uh, healthcare system. So if everybody's done with that one, I guess we can go ahead and ask the next question. Okay, I'll go ahead and introduce the next question to our panelists. Um, what issues do you see are the largest examples of health inequity in your community? Is there a specific component of health equity you believe does not receive enough recognition? Um, if you need me to receive the question, I'll be more than happy to do so. I can, um, go I can oh, sorry, go ahead. You can go, go ahead, you can go first, sorry about that. No, no problem, uh, thanks. So, as I mentioned earlier, I've worked with the Hispanic community a lot, and I myself am Hispanic, and I think a large barrier for health issues among the Latino and Hispanic community is definitely Spanish-speaking people. I think that's a barrier we overlook a lot in public health because most of us are English speaking or may not speak another language. And so I know that ADPH has great material when it comes to COVID-19, but we literally quite, we literally lose that in translation in Spanish because we don't have a lot of Latino and Hispanic people in public health. I think I'm a handful of students in the School of Public Health who are, who recognize themselves as Latino or Latina. And just seeing that in my own experience of Spanish speaking, lack of resources for Spanish speakers, you know, going to the doctor, reading pamphlets. I've often had to be the own translator for my family just because my mother doesn't speak English very well. So when I go to the doctor, I have to translate for her because unfortunately, even though under law, it's your right to have a translator, they nine times out of 10 don't have a translator. So usually a family member will have to translate for them, but that can be a bit of an issue because when a family member is translating, there can be an issue of where, for example, if it's a younger daughter with a mother, you know, the younger daughter will want to disclose everything to their mother, but if the mother is the translator, then she's just going to tell her whatever the mom wants to know. So if that, let's say that young daughter may be in her teens and she may be sexually active, you know, she won't want to disclose that to her mother. But because that young daughter can't speak English to her doctor or the doctor doesn't have a translator or speak Spanish, she'll have to lie about her activity and what she does. Because like I said, there's just things with HIPAA that as parents and as children, we don't want to talk to our family members about. That's why we have medical providers. And so, like I said, I know in states such as California, there's a lot of Hispanic, a lot of Hispanic people, but translators are widely available in places like that in New York. But here in Alabama, it's unusual to find somebody who speaks Spanish in the general public. And that's one main issue I wanted to touch on. And the other issue is diabetes in the Hispanic community. 
you know, how are you going to deconstruct food that's been eaten for generations, you know, tamales, enchiladas, tacos, you know, they all, they're all really good, but their nutritional value and sodium value, sodium intake and sugar intake are really high in these kinds of foods. And so there's been this issue of how do you tell specifically the Mexican community, because that's where I was raised. How do you tell them, hey, these foods aren't necessarily good for you, but, you know, these are our cultural foods. This is how I was raised. This is the foods we eat on holidays. These are the foods we eat on a regular basis. These are the foods we make when there's nothing else to eat. You know, tortillas are a staple in Mexican culture. That's our bread. And so it's just kind of like food that's been made, passed down from my grandmother to my mother to me. You know, how, are we, how am I supposed to tell my whole family that, hey, this food isn't good for you? Because it's almost like I, I feel like it's trying to deconstruct an entire culture. You can't really do that. And it's it's an issue I've often had to face in my own community because it's just like I know that that's why my own grandmother passed away from diabetes, because she would eat her she would eat her own food. She would eat Mexican food that's not necessarily healthy. And she ended up dying because of it. And it was not it was not a peaceful death. And it's just like, it's not, it's not only my family diabetes affects, it affects a lot of Mexican families. And it's just one of these things that I don't know how to help the community. I don't know how to do it because there is a lack of research of diabetes among the Hispanic community. Um, I can go next. Sorry about that. I was trying to unmute. Um, I know one day I was shadowing and a young lady, she was, she was Hispanic. Um, I think she was like 13 years old. And she came in there with like bad, bad stomach ache and stomach cramps. And the doctor kept saying, oh, it's nothing but like a bad stomach ache. I'll give you something for it. And she came back the next day and he told her the same thing. And she kept coming back. And I was like, man, may, well, maybe we should run the test, you know, but I'm just shadowing. So I can't overstep. And I was like, maybe you guys should like run a test. And he was like, well, no, it's just a bad stomach ache. So she came back the following week and they actually decided to run the test. Her uterus was flipped, I think, like upside down or something to where her menstrual cycle, instead of coming down, it was going up. But I felt like that could have been like he, he could have found that sooner if he just ran a test like the first time she came. So I felt like that was like, to me, a sign of health inequity, because if it was maybe another person probably would have ran the test quicker. I just want to share that story. Yeah, I would like to share something, too, that um, uh, it was a a health impact assessment I did down in East Orlando, which is predominantly a Latinx community. And um, during the health impact assessment, I went out and did some field work and uh, went to all the local bus stops and did a little questionnaire asking some of the bus riders, you know, where they were going, what they were doing, and a good portion of them were going to doctor's appointments. And they were telling me that you know, the bus sometimes is late. They miss their doctor's appointments. Sometimes the bus never shows up. And I'm looking around. I'm like, no, wait, this can't be possible. There was like four bus stops that I could see in a radius. And I'm pretty privy to, to riding the bus uh, in my neighborhood. So I was like, this is not something that I have witnessed in my neighborhood. But sure enough, um, one of the I, I witnessed it myself. I just so happened to be there one of the days that this happened where the gentleman sitting next to me in a wheelchair, the bus was too full. Um, so he, he was not able to get on. And then the next bus was late. So he missed his doctor's appointment. He ended up going back home. Um, all too often this happens. And I actually didn't realize, realize uh, you, sometimes you have to see things with your own eyes to actually realize the, the impacts that it has on people. And, you know, we have about 6 million people worldwide who miss, or, or in the United States who miss doctor's appointments because of a lack of transportation or transportation network efficiency within cities and municipalities. And here's the other thing, there's disparities with that. Transportation networks in lower income parts of town sometimes are desegmented de and um, run at a lesser capacity versus other parts of town that might have a higher income, um, which doesn't make sense. It should be the opposite because the people in those uh, parts of town with the lower income should have the better transportation infrastructure. So I actually witnessed what you're talking about, even in Orlando, where we're very, very liberal and, and um, have plans in place for this type of stuff, sometimes this, it gets convoluted and, and things are still, there's still disparities that are there, even when people are trying to work on them. And I think sometimes it takes the grassroots level, sometimes people like us to get out there and try to make a change and, and open and keep the discussion going. 
Thank you all for sharing those stories. Um, I'm sorry we can't get to everyone on the panel with this one. We do have to move on. Um, if we could, I love the discussion we're having, but if we could keep responses just a little bit shorter to give everyone a, a you know, more of a chance to speak, that would be great. But seriously, thank you all. That's so good so far. Um, well, the next question actually kind of gives you guys an opportunity, those of you who haven't answered because it's kind of similar. Um, here it is. If you feel comfortable sharing, what are some of your personal experiences with health inequity? I can repeat that if you like, just let me know. I guess I'll speak finally. Um, so personal experience with health inequity, um, I'm from a rural community in Alabama. So there's just really hard access to care specialized care specifically in my area. So I know um, I've had family members who have had to travel over hours, like hours and hours away to Birmingham, Huntsville or other major cities to, to get specialized care that honestly should be more available within the area. Um, our health department is an example of this. I had a situation where I needed a TB test just, you know, just to be here with you all today. And I had to travel out of the county to get a TB test because my local health department was no longer providing them. So it's just, basic necessity things like a TB test or an HIV test that's not accessible in some of these in some of these low-income communities and just areas that is a really big issue with helping inequality in just my area and other areas in the south. I can add on to that as a black queer woman in the South, as a gender queer person in the South, um, mental health access has been a really big barrier personally. If I want to see a provider who is from my context and who understands um, Black identity and LGBTQ identity without me having to be the educator to them in my, in my session, um, I'm very out of luck in, in terms of finding a provider who is uh, understanding or like directly relates to my context or is at least very, very trained in my context. So in the arena of mental health, there is still so much um, inequity in terms of finding LGBTQ inclusive and, and competent providers. And then on the other hand, in terms of um, physical health, um, I've been in situations where I've wondered if I'm actually being listened to by my provider, especially if that provider is a white cisgender straight male, um, because we know that there are studies saying that um, providers tend to not believe black people about their pain. Um, so that's been in the back of my mind in a couple of interactions that I've had where I wondered, um, even at the dentist, you know, is this person actually listening to, to what I'm saying about my pain? Um, I would say that I've been fortunate enough to have access to resources and services like that, but um, being in public health and having a passion for service, I have seen numerous individuals with different experiences with health inequities. And one of my main research pass passions, I guess you could say, is looking at menstrual health and hygiene um, inequities, basically. So there's plenty of women, even students at UAB who have difficulties receiving just basic menstrual hygiene needs. Um, UAB has done some, taken some steps to provide like free um, hygienic products in the bathrooms, but in Birmingham, it's still a big issue that homeless um, women don't have those kinds of needs. And there's even been studies with women in prison systems that basically have to barter for pads and tampons. Um, and that's, that to me, that's something that's just really unacceptable. Like that's nothing that anyone can prevent or change or alter without having to go to a doctor and do that and pay money for that. And um, that's just something on a smaller scale, but can have really big impacts in other areas of um, a person's life. So that's just kind of my perspective on this question. But. Okay. Uh, thank you everybody for your answers. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to question number five. 
Um, in your perspective, what are some of the things that you believe are fundamental to achieving health equity? Um, if you need the question repeated, I will be more than welcome to. I guess I can start this one. Um, I think one of the main things that needs to happen to achieve health equity is a change of mindset, um, especially in policymakers and um, you know individuals who have those authority positions. Um, a lot of it is something that an individual person can't change. And so it's something that they have to take the steps to implement. And a lot of people still do not, some people don't understand what health equity is, but a lot of people don't think that it's something that needs to be addressed with laws and policies. Um, so I definitely think that's probably one of the first steps that we need to take. I'm so glad you mentioned policymakers because right now there's a bill in front of our Alabama state legislature which seeks to interfere in the healthcare decisions of trans youth uh, and their families. And so a deep, deep lack of understanding mixed with a little bit of bigotry is what is fueling that, right? And so obviously I think there needs to be much more um, focus on implicit bias training. I know that this is something that people do, uh, but it's not it's not hitting right. So, implicit bias training, um, general awareness, so that patients aren't always having to educate their providers on their experiences. Um, we are in the South, and so we have a lack of funding around HIV and STI related causes, despite being um, an area of the country where we see those rates be highly prevalent. Um, there's so much. Oh, housing and healthcare is uh, tied together, right? So if you don't have access to safe housing, that affects your healthcare. If you don't have access to safe work, that affects your healthcare. For our trans community, if you're not able to acquire a job where you can have insurance that covers your transition related healthcare, that's a matter of health equity. Um, so there's so, so much to go in terms of um, making access completely equitable and just to everyone in the community. And I um, appreciate you sharing that perspective on transgender individuals, because I know in California, you can actually have your transition funded by the state. And I think that's one of few states that actually provide resources for transgender people. And going from there, I think a way we can help with universal health care is empowering women helping women who maybe are single mothers, helping women get jobs that actually pay the rent. I know financial issues are a huge burden on many single women on, in this country, because back, I believe, in the during the Reagan and Clinton era, they took the eligibility for welfare down. So it became a stricter means of how you could get welfare. So millions of single mothers who used to get these benefits from the government all of a sudden had their rugs ripped from under them because now they had to not only find a full-time job to cover all the bills, they have now two, three children. And it's been shown that the better educated a mother is or the higher income she has. Again, this is not true for all people, but generally speaking, it means that their children will be healthier in the long run. You know, they won't have the financial stress of worrying about whether or not they're gonna have a roof over the head for the children. And I've, I'm not sure if everyone's heard this, but they, it has been said that poverty is almost like a syndrome because you have so much stress, so much chemical, so much lack of serotonin in your body that makes, can make you immunocompromised, can make you lose weight, gain weight, can cause so many mental health issues. So poverty within itself, we should uplift people out of poverty to help with health, health equity, excuse me, health equity overall. I'm just gonna add in something really quick, I promise. <laughs> um, talking about policy, you know, I think that that is definitely where it starts. And unfortunately, this is the reality of it. And I'm saying this from experience that you could have the entire staff of a city or a county or state or the federal administration who believes that this is the way we should go that we want health equity and we have these policies programs ready to be implemented. We've got them done. They're binded. They're ready to go. But if the political will is not there, it's going to go on a shelf and collect dust and you're going to be shunned to the side. And therein lies the issue is that you have these administrations coming in, cycling in, 
four, six years, whether it be local, county, state, or federal government. And you have your public administrators, like for instance, what I was an urban planner or, or whoever might be on the staff at the city, you might have a, a health equity specialist, somebody who is out there promoting that stuff. And even though you have that, um, the, the mayor and the council do not support it, but they let it happen because it shows good face. How do we address those issues? And how do we, at a grassroots level, I keep going back to that because I, I really feel like that's where it needs to start. And even with that, it's going to be in increments. So I just wanted to add that in from a personal experience and working in government for many years that, you know, it, everybody can be on board with something, but, and you might be ready to do something. And then all of a sudden the, may, the mayor switches and all of that, you get taken back two or three years. Um, it's really frustrating. And, and sometimes I sit and wonder how, how can we all as, as, you know, how can we all come together and solve this? So I don't know. Those are really great questions, David, and they actually lead directly into what our next question would be. Um, I feel like it's kind of redundant to ask it now. It was, do you believe health inequity is more of a policy or personal issue? Um, so we've kind of answered that. It's really, really both, but more so policy, I would say. Um, so I'll go to the seventh question, which is kind of a follow-up question to that one. Um, do you feel like Birmingham's local government does an adequate job at working to improve health equity? How do you believe they can do better? For those of you who are actually attending UAB, what about their administration? If you'd like me to repeat it, of course I will. That was like a really big mouthful. Oh, Claudia, do you want to start? Yeah, I can kind of start. I can speak on UAB's behalf. I know that as a student, as a female on campus, um, I think we have a lot of resources for us in terms of reproductive system. And I know birth control is an option. There are contraceptives for free available for students at the Student Wellness Center. Uh, I know Sarah mentioned earlier that we're still working on menstrual products for women, people with uteruses who may not have access to that because it's really expensive. I don't know if people, I don't know if people know how expensive menstrual products are. Um, and I think that UAB has a lot of room to improve, especially with the insurance aspect, because as a student on the health insurance, my health insurance is really limited on what I can and cannot use it for. Um, I'm, I'll kind of go off of that. I know that the Student Wellness Center um, has a lot of great benefits for students, but it is limited based on um, what kind of insurance you do have. and as a UAB student, you have to have health insurance in order to basically attend school. Um, but in the Birmingham area, I know there's some things that are going in the right direction. I know like the health department has taken steps to implement health equity into their, um, into their program plans and everything, but I think there's definitely still more that needs to be done. I think there will always be more that needs to be done, especially right now. Um, but I think the city and UAB are on the right track into doing that. Um, if any of the panelists don't have anything to say right now, um, would the audience like to add anything they think UAB could do better or is currently doing? Hey, this is Amanda. I also work at the Magic City Acceptance Center with Lauren. Um, and I would really love to see UAB. Um, uh, we're just going to be all about like queer and trans folks because that's what we do all day every day. But I would love to see UAB uh, lessen or just completely abolish barriers for trans students in every way, shape and form in terms of them being able to identify as who they are and graduate and have their name read the way that it is. Um, education is health too. And so being able to walk across the stage and be called by the name that you use and have your diploma have the name that you use, um, those are all barriers to health because if you can't find employment um, because your name is not affirmed, that's an issue. And so um, while UAB is incredible and has, has done a lot for the LGB community, um, I'm still waiting to see a lot more work be done around trans individuals. I don't mean to sound ignorant or anything, but regarding that, it, wouldn't that be up to the individual to change their name legally? Because I'm sure there's something that's legally required to have your name a certain way on the diploma. 
I hear that and I understand that point. So yes, on the diploma, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of calling students by the name that they use when they call it out on stage, that shouldn't be a requirement to have your name legally changed because that in itself is a barrier that depending on which county you come from, um, there is a different cost associated. And additionally, you have to um, go through a lot of steps to change your birth certificate. There are some people who just can't change their name because they don't have their birth certificate for reasons of um, being kicked out of their home when they were young and any number of things. So there are a lot of barriers people don't consider that us white privileged folks who are cisgender haven't ever had to consider. And so it seems like something that would be easy when in fact it is not. Thank you, that answered, I guess, that question. And I wanted to add to that, I, I myself am an LGBT ally and I've recently wanted to have my last name changed to Donna Martinez. I feel like it better reflects me as a Hispanic person. And I've had difficulty myself having my name correctly presented as I want it, as how I identify. Obviously transgender people, it's different for them than it is for me, but I sympathize with them because I prefer having Donna Martinez as my last name versus my legal last name, just because I feel like it better represents me. And if I've had to jump through hoops and email people, people about, hey, can you address me this way? Claudia, we finished. It kind of cut out for me, but that could have just been my thing. Oh, I was just saying that I feel like my name, uh, that I have to contact a lot of people to uh, have them address me by the name I prefer versus the name that on a piece of paper, just because I feel like it represents me better culturally speaking. All right. Is there anybody else that would like to speak on this matter? It's like a really big question, so I, I guess we could get a lot of answers for it. If not, that's okay. Um, Echo, I'm sorry, I think there are sirens. I don't know if they're super loud. Um, David's comments about transportation, I think that's a place where the city could really do a lot of work. Um, I can't tell you how many people reach out to us as a social services organization seeking transportation to um, their appointments or, or to, you know, to mental health appointments, to their doctor's appointments, uh, and that being a really big barrier. And of course, there are things like um, Uber has a health uh, component. I don't think that it's available in Birmingham or available at many places in Birmingham. You can fact check me if anybody knows better. Um, but the fact that we're now relying on, and I shouldn't say relying on because maybe it is a clever solution, but Uber as a way to get people to their appointments is really interesting. Um, whereas I think the city could really invest in something to, to meet that. And I know the city's working on things. I know there's the um, Oh, I just completely blanked on the name of it, the, the vans that are downtown now, and, and there may be solutions that are coming down the pipeline, um, but that still remains a huge barrier. Lauren, um, I want to add on something that I know I'm not a panelist, but I, I guess I'm technically an audience member. Um, my mother works with a woman who was recently diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, and she unfortunately is lower income. So her battle with cancer is going to be significantly harder. Um, she doesn't own a car and she lives very far away from the nearest cancer center. And so um, we found a way to, to find this. We found this service that would take her from her um, the hotel that she's staying at to the cancer center. And so they pick her up and they, you know, take her down to, we live in Huntsville. So from Madison to South Huntsville, if any of you are aware of that, it's a very far drive. Um, and they're, you know, the woman and the driver of the car talking about her cancer and the driver is like, um, oh yeah, it, it's really bad that you have ovarian cancer. And the woman's like, no, I actually have breast cancer. And the the actual transportation was only for people with ovarian cancer and the woman just drops her off and just drops her off in the Huntsville emergency room. And listen, I know that's just a very specific instance, but it's like the complete disregard for these individuals as actual people to them, to a lot of people, it's just cases or numbers. So I feel like that's really exemplary of exactly what you were talking about. Okay. Uh, before we move on to our, Next question, I'm going to open it up again. Does anybody have any last comments about this question that they'd like to speak, panelists or audience members? OK, um, so moving forward, uh, uh, my next question I'm going to address to the panel. Um, how do you believe UAB and Birmingham communities as a whole can support health equity 
and what can we do on a person to person basis? Um, and this is specifically people and not the administration. So if you need the question uh, to be restated, by all means, let me know. I think a lot of this was kind of discussed in the last question as well. Um, I think definitely one thing is addressing those social determinants of health. Um, there's basically every social determinant of health is linked with health equity and health disparities. Um, and I think that the city and UAB need to recognize what those um, determinants are and take the proper steps to address those. So with Birmingham administration um, addressing poverty and housing, um, housing policies and looking at how those can impact a person's health and access to healthcare. And then from a UAB, UAB perspective, um, this goes along with the health insurance as well. Just recognizing what those barriers are for students and making, making things more accessible for the students at UAB and partnering with the city to make things more accessible for people within the entire community because UAB is such a excellent place for public health, for healthcare, for medical services. So there should be some sort of partnership, some program that can help alleviate those disparities, in my opinion, I guess. <laughs> Does anybody else work with the city, but also belong to the UAB campus? Like, can anybody else speak for that kind of interaction? If not, that's okay. Just anybody, if they want to share their perspective, they can go ahead. Um, if not, I can fill some things in. Um, I don't work for the city per se. I work for the state in collaboration with UAB as a contact tracer. So we make phone calls to people who have tested positive for COVID-19. And an issue I've noticed a lot is people are worried about getting the vaccine. A lot of the myths that come around getting the vaccine and we are still receiving training on how to speak to patients about receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. But moving from that, I know that a lot of people are scared of COVID and they have these myths about conspiracy theories that may surround COVID. And another issue I've had is we can't, as a contract tracer, we can't provide financial relief to these people. So more often than not, they'll be like, okay, well, I have to quarantine, but my job's not going to pay me for those 10 days. So I often find myself in this place where all I can really offer them is the COVID-19 hotline from ADPH. And in Alabama, I believe we don't really offer any financial incentives or any financial relief for people who have to quarantine and lose almost a whole week of pay, which can be detrimental to them. I never actually considered that, Claudia. Thank you for sharing that. The, I'm sure the financial aspect is incredibly significant. Um, if anybody else would like to share their perspective, please do. I, of course, invite the audience to talk about their career path if they would like. Um, anybody? I was gonna add, I am not an economist, I'm far from it, but I hope it's not too much to say. Universal healthcare, universal basic income, free menstruation products everywhere, the end. Very well said. I can talk a little bit about my projected career path because again, count as an audience member. Um, so I am currently a public health major, but I have wanted to switch over to double major in civil engineering for a really long time. Um, and I'll be doing that this fall. And something I've encountered with trying to arrange that um, is there are not a lot of people that want to do that. And engineering infrastructure, especially modern engineering infrastructure, is really focused on um, profit and not necessarily accessibility. Uh, that's a really big issue when looking for sustainable solutions. Um, and so that's kind of what I personally want to do, but that's just, that's a whole nother hour to talk about sustainable and accessible solutions. But so that is also technically our last question if nobody else has anything to share. Um, I would like to ask the panelists we, we can open it up to the audience to talk about what equity means to them and all that good stuff. But I would really like for the panelists to say one succinct, succinct statement since our topic is technically building bridges to achieve 
health equity. If you could say one thing that you want the audience to remember and you know everybody else here, what would it be? That kind of puts you on the spot, I'm sorry. But if you could do that, that would be cool. Yes, I'll go first. Um, our health affects all of us. So if someone's hurting somewhere, whether that be Africa, whether that be China, whether that be the US, we all hurt. Um, COVID is the biggest example of that. Some, it happened in China and it got to us. So when we, when we talk about healthcare, we have to be equitable with everyone because when one community hurts, we all end up, we all end up hurting. And to add on to that, um, again, I, don't, I can't speak for the entire Hispanic and Latino community, but I would just wanna say, I wish there was more research being done among the indigenous Latin, Latin Hispanic community. Um, and I wanna dedicate my career to doing that. And I guess just keep in mind that, you know, there's a lot of groups of people that need help in public health. And we all don't have to focus on every single group. There's reasons why we have researchers in one, in one group versus another, and that we should all be open to doing research or helping each community as much as we can. I would just, um just kind of leave you guys with this. No, um, don't ever let anyone steal your voice in terms of, of you know, uh, having dialogue and, and having um, these goals that you want to make a change. Um, like I was saying earlier, um, you have the political powers that be that do try to steal people's voice or, or uh, steal the community's voice, even though they're there to actually help the community. Um, most of the time. Um, it, it's something that we all have to work together. And I keep saying this at a grassroots level and keep just celebrate the small victories, the increments, because we might not see what we want to see in our lifetimes be achieved. But if we're celebrating those small victories, we, we can feel accomplished in some degree that we are leaving a platform for the next generation or the next people who are going to pick this up to continue with. And, um, you know, I always have to think like that because paradigm shifts slowly, um, potentially with COVID-19, with it being a punctuated equilibrium type of, of, of scenario, maybe there will be significant changes more so than, than I can even dream of. Maybe there will be, because sometimes it takes punctuated equilibrium for that to happen, for paradigm shifts to occur. Um, but I would just leave, leave everyone with that, that, you know, don't be disappointed when things don't happen right away. We can, we can, you know, really get out there and, and try, but, you know, it, it, you just, just celebrate the small victories. That's all, that's all I'm going to leave you with that. Celebrate the small victories because it's going to come in small increments. It really is. I can share really quickly. I hope this doesn't, this is supposed to be closing. I hope it's not opening a whole other conversation, but um, the reason that we opened the Acceptance Center was because at the time that we opened in um, 2014, uh, HIV infections, the highest rate of HIV infection were incurring in folks ages 13 to 24 here in the South. And so obviously that was a huge disparity. Um, and so we originally opened just to be a safe place to provide access to testing and education, knowing that across the state, our students aren't receiving Many of them aren't receiving any uh, comprehensive sexual health education at all, much less are any of them receiving uh, education that is LGBTQ inclusive or LGBTQ centered. And so in the seven years that we've existed, that's always been at the core of what we've done. And to David's point around celebrating small victories, we're now getting to the point where youth know that they were, we're a safe space for them to access that testing and education. And more and more often, we're finally being invited into schools in the area to share that uh, sexual health and consent workshops. So that's something that I'm really excited for us to continue doing. It is a huge, huge barrier and conversation in our community and something that needs to be addressed expeditiously. Um, I guess my, my takeaway from this is, I hope that y'all have the mindset that health isn't a choice. Um, health is not something that you can choose or largely, it's not something you can choose. It's a result from various different factors that people don't have control over. And it is important to recognize that and address those, um, address those issues that surround the factors like that. And 
by doing that, that's how we can achieve health equity and create a better life for everyone in the U.S. and in the world. Was that everyone on the panel? I, I thought we were missing one person. I'm not sure. Maybe not. Um, well, either way, we are very close to running out of time. Um, and there is one last follow up question I wanted to pose to everybody. Dr. Chamless suggested it. Um, and it is, what do you think your role can be to help bridge the gap to equity and reducing health disparities? And that's for anyone in the audience to answer. Um, preferably make it quick. But of course, I would love to discuss as much as possible. Um, I just think that maybe we can educate people better. Um, tell people like why we need this to happen. You know, we need to happen quickly. I think education plays a role in a, a lot of things. So, yeah. I just say really quick, you know, my, um, I feel the way I could make an impact is I, I, my goal. I'm a doctoral student. My goal is to be a professor and is to, when I studied in Korea, they called the professors and teachers there, they called them nation builders. And I, I immediately was attracted to that notion that they called them that uh, because it's true. And why don't we call them that here? Um, so not only is your professor, you might, I'm teaching undergraduate students or maybe freshmen who are just, you know, so embedding some of these ideals in them throughout the course structure, um, I think could be some way, a way that I could help. You know, that's why I left planning with urban planning, I could only help the people in the confines of the municipality in which I was planning for. That might only be 30,000, that might only be 100,000. Whereas a, being a professor, I can do my research and publications and through my students and my courses, I can make an impact, which can be much more significant than just one municipality. So I, I feel like that's where I can make an impact. And working with the local community as well in Birmingham. I love bridge building. I think our community as an LGBTQ community, and please don't let me speak on behalf of the entire, I could never, um, but we're at the point of demanding and we've been at the point of demanding for a very long time. So there's only so much hand holding that we can do with people because the situation and a lot of these health issues for our community are dire. We didn't get anything uh, during the height of the HIV AIDS crisis without demanding and without activism, without making people pay attention when they didn't want to. Um, I think the same thing is playing out for us now around this issue around trans healthcare. In a lot of ways, it's still playing out around HIV. Um, so being open to building those bridges, but also recognizing the, the context of power and privilege and bias and oppression that plays into these conversations is really, really real. And so not putting the onus on uh, an individual patient to, to have to address that on their own, right? So like we talked about policy being a huge part of what um, is actually going to make these changes in the long run um, and policy through demanding what is needed because I mean, just to talk about trans youth again, um, the suicide rate for trans youth we know is abysmal and terrifying. So the situation for us is really and truly dire. Okay, um, before we close out uh, this panel, I'm gonna ask for more time before we go. Um, is there anybody else, panelist, audience members, anybody wants to uh, make a remark or a statement on the question proposed by Dr. Chambliss? Okay, well, I wanna um, personally say thank you so much to every panelist here. This was a wonderful discussion. Um, I'm glad this happened. Um, and I think this really opened the door um, I think this really opened a lot of people's minds up to what health equity is and inequity and how we can achieve that moving forward with our career paths and person to person, how we can um, advocate for things like this. I want to thank the Public Health uh, Student Association and the USGA for helping co-sponsor this event to bring this to the forefront for National Public Health Week. Um, so with that being said, um, Olivia, do you have any other closing remarks? that you'd like to speak or? Uh, not particularly. I just really want to stress again, this was a fantastic discussion. Um, I see a lot of people in the chat saying it was a really good event and it absolutely was. Um, it actually turned out a lot better, not, not a lot better than I thought it did. I always had faith, um, but it definitely went places I didn't expect it to go and it was fantastic. So thank you all for everyone who's been here and uh, worked to put it together. Great job. Thank you.